let me show you one of my favourite sites on the island, one which has been sadly misunderstood in years past, and which even today is largely unnoticed by the thousands of people who drive past it each year. Here it is, Kronk Howe Moor. Nowadays it's just a large green hill rising up from a flat landscape outside Port Erin, and you need a strong imagination to see it for what it really is, the remains of a 900-year-old fort. Now, this is a site which, when it was dug nearly a hundred years ago, was almost completely misinterpreted by the archaeologists. Practically everything they said about it was wrong. Now, that's not to criticise them, it's just that they were interpreting what they found with the best information available in 1912. And since then, we've learned a great deal more about this type of structure. And so today, we can give a much more accurate account of what happened here. Now, when Philip Kermode started to dig here just a century ago, the first thing he did was to cut a section into the side of the hill, and he found a layer of clay, and on top of that, a layer of loose gravel and a layer of sand, and so on for a considerable distance. Now, they were only shallow layers, but it led him to the conclusion that this was an entirely natural hill formed by the water coming from the melting glaciers at the end of the last ice age and carrying all this material with it. In fairness, you can see this layering elsewhere on the island. If you look at the cliffs at the north of the island, you can see layers created at the end of the last ice age as the ice sheets melted. You can see shingle on sand and layers of different materials caught in the cliffs. But we now know that didn't happen here. If it had, how did all the land surrounding here get washed away, just leaving this mound? No. The geomorphologists, those people who study the processes that shape the land, are quite clear that this is not a natural feature. And that means it's man-made. And that means it's incredible. Well, I was hoping to get to the summit of the hill to show you the view from up there, but the bracken this year is so tall, it's actually over the top of my head, so we won't be able to see very much. What we can see from here is a definite trench, a moat, round the bottom of the hill. And here we can see another man-made structure, a great ramp that comes up to the edge of the moat. So, with a moat and ramp identified, what else did the archaeologists find during their dig? Well, on the top of the mound they found the remains of a great pit that was lined with stones. Their conclusion was that people had adapted this so-called natural mound to use as a defensive area and that they fought from behind a rampart running round the top of the hill. Unfortunately, that was wrong as well. We now know that this is a classic Mott and Bailey castle. It has all the hallmarks of that type of defensive structure introduced by the Normans when they invaded England in 1066. What we can see is a hill with a moat around it. The pit on top was actually the base for the wooden castle that stood there. The ramp from the right-hand side would have led to a drawbridge over the moat. The whole construction would probably have been surrounded by a paling fence, which also might have enclosed some small buildings, which could be used as a refuge for people and cattle. A mot of similar size in England contains 22,000 tonnes of soil and took 50 men 80 days to build. So why were these mounds built in layers, which could only add hugely to the expense of their construction? Well, this was a technique developed by the Normans to add greater strength to these artificial hills. I can only assume if it was just a pile of soil, it would soon wash away and erode. And if Kermode had have dug further in, he may well have come across the remains of huge timbers which were often added for further strength. We actually have a picture of the Normans constructing the first ever Motton Bailey castle they built in England before the Battle of Hastings. And it's in that remarkable piece of stitching, the Bayeux Tapestry. Now you may know that the Bayeux Tapestry is over 60 metres long 
and is a remarkable record of the preparation for and the actual battle of Hastings. The detail is extraordinary, and at one point a group of our little French friends are busy building a castle with simple mattocks and shovels. But they're building it in layers, just like Cronkhow Moor. This was Britain's first Mott and Bailey castle. The different coloured stitching indicates layers of different types of earth. Yes, 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 we know you're about to win the Battle of Hastings, but I can tell you one thing. Yes? You don't win at Waterloo. We can only guess at who might have built this castle and why, though an ancient Welsh chronicle tells us that in 1102, the Viking king Magnus Barelegs came to the Isle of Man and built himself three castles, ordering the men of Galloway in Scotland to bring timber here for that purpose. It's only speculation, but this place, along with the castles at Russian and Peel, might have been the three referred to. And it's even possible that Castle Russian itself started out as a simple Mott and Bailey construction, like the one here at Cronkhow Moor. 